Hello, everyone, to wherever you're Zooming in from. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Nevada Berg. Nevada Berg was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, and during her life's journey found herself in Norway. She resides in the medieval valley of Numedal with her Norwegian husband and son. She is the author and creator of award-winning Norwegian food and cultural website, North Wild Kitchen. Her recipes and stories are inspired by traditions and history, as well as innovative approaches to Norwegian ingredients. In 2008, Nevada released her first cookbook internationally with resounding success as one of the best cookbooks for the fall by the New York Times. She was also the TV program leader for Mat Kanalen's Österreichsen series. Nevada is regarded internationally as one of the most recognized voices for Norwegian food. Nevada, now I turn it over to you. Hi everyone. <laughs> oh, I just want to say a big thank you to Leah and to Josh and Andrew and all the Westerheim Museum for having me and giving me this opportunity to share and talk with you all about Norwegian food, which is just so wonderful. And thank you all for joining today. And I look forward to hearing your questions at the end. Uh, and that was a wonderful introduction. So I just wanted to give you all another brief introduction about, about me and my background. And as Josh said, I am from the US originally and my, I'm from Salt Lake City, my parents from Colorado. So very much a mountain girl, I love the mountains. So it's perfect for Norway. I did a study abroad in England and that's where I met my Norwegian husband. Uh, who's from Bergen. So he's my Norwegian connection. And we basically lived, that was about 15 years ago. So we have lived in different places. We lived in England for about five years. Then we moved to Mozambique where uh, we had our son. And then for that was two years. And then we moved to Rome, Italy for two and a half years. And so when I grew up, I had my mother and she was, just loves food. She's a great cook and she always had cookbooks around the house. And for me, it was always a joy of just flipping through the pages and seeing the, the images and trying to connect, you know, the ingredients and, and the stories behind it. And it really wasn't, I, I did work within the, industry, the food industry for a little bit when I was at university. So I got to see a little bit more side of it. But it wasn't really until I left the US and was living abroad when I started to really want to sink deeper into food and culture and what it means behind the plate and what it means to different people and why they eat what they're eating and where things are coming from. And being able to kind of separate from what I had known was really important because it enabled me to grow and to not rely on all those things that I needed, but to look closer to what was available to me. And so from Mozambique and England and of course in Italy was all about soaking up the, the dishes and learning more about it. And it was just so wonderful. And so when we were in Rome, we had been very nomadic and we had our son and we decided it was time to kind of settle down and, and get some roots. So Norway seemed like the most, you know, the best place to do it, to raise a child, have a family. And so we decided that we would move and it kind of was this, this opportunity because I thought, okay, we're going to be moving. We were moving to this small village in Norway and we thought, okay, well, what can I do? I mean, I, I was at home with my son and now I have this opportunity and I thought, okay, I want to do, if I had a dream job, it'd be working with the food and the culture and combining my passion for photography and writing and, and just learning more about Norway, because to be honest, I, you know, it's quite easy to learn about Italian food and even English food, but Norwegian food was a bit of an anomaly for me. And even though I knew a little bit from my husband's family and their traditions, it still felt very foreign and very mysterious. And I really wanted to dig deeper. And it was almost like this kind of calling, if you will, or just an excitement. And I remember when I was in Rome, and I had a friend and she's from Northern Norway. And she, I was telling her my idea of, oh, I wanna go and figure out and learn more about the food culture. And she was saying, oh, you know, when I was a little girl, my dad used to always take me, we'd go fishing and hunting. And I really took it for granted, but I missed those days of, you know, foraging for berries and, and we'd always get chanterelles. 
And I remember I had to stop her because I thought, this is so exciting. And I thought, chanterelles? He was like, I was like flabbergasted because I couldn't imagine that in Norway you had chanterelles just right at your door. It was just something that I just couldn't put the two together. And I then from that moment knew that there was something so incredible that we needed to kind of bridge the gap between this new Nordic uh, cuisine that was being presented and the very, very traditional and to just kind of show all the different nuances that is available. So we left Rome and that was 2015 and we made our way to this tiny lovely village of 1400 people in Rolag, which there's also Rolag, Minnesota. So I guess we're the sister cities and uh, you know, a beautiful place. We have no family, we had nothing here. We just, it was an opportunity and we decided to take it. We bought a farm and we decided to put our roots here. And so uh, Josh is gonna show you a little video that we shared a little while ago, which just kind of gives you uh, a feel for the place. I arrived in a place, an unexpected place deep in the belly of Norway, where the mountains tower and a river carves its way through a winding valley, a place called Numedal, a medieval gem where I draw my inspiration. I knew about some of the traditional dishes and some of the newer influences of Norway's food culture, but had heard whispers of something more. I challenged myself to look beyond what I knew to explore the depths of this dynamic culture and share my journey with the rest of the world. One of the first ingredients I began using when I arrived was juniper. The earthy flavor from the berries alone always makes me feel grounded, more rooted in my surroundings. Its versatility creates numerous culinary opportunities explored and yet to be explored. Okay, so that kind of shows you a little bit of, of where we are. And Numedal is so special because it is the medieval valley. It has the most medieval buildings of all of Norway. And it's like a little hidden gem, very rustic. So it's a really wonderful place. I feel very, I should say, I feel incredibly blessed that I have the opportunity to share a culture that's not even really my own, but they've embraced me so warmly here. And I'm very, very humbled every day and acknowledge that it is a gift to be able to go out and explore and, and take these things. And I never want to take it for granted. And so going from that story of the chanterelles, the first season we were here that autumn, we took a walk and found so many chanterelles laying along the mossy floor and it was just such a beautiful like circle to come back to hearing that story of, of what is available and then being able to to find it myself and chanterelles is one of my absolute favorite mushrooms and something that I can go right out the door and we can find it uh, every autumn so it's so lovely and that's pretty much when I just started to say I want to share this culture and, and I'm going to do it in a way that I can have a voice and that's North Wild Kitchen. And it's, it's kind of the platform to be able to share. And it's also about the stories. I'll get into the recipes in a minute, but the stories is really important because it's always about, you know, a recipe is a recipe and a plate of food is a plate of food. But it's when you get to know what's going on behind it is when it really becomes something special. When you know who's making it and why they're making it, why it's important to the culture. And all these things create an incredible ambiance that helps with the food culture itself. And so I often will share stories of producers or neighbors or anyone who's shared their recipes with me or showing what they're doing to further and continue 
the Norwegian food culture, as well as just uplifting traditions. So I have lovely women here who have shared their lefse recipes, um, you know, the bakery here, just so many people and, and they have such wonderful stories. And so that's a big part of what I love to do. And on top of that is, of course, the recipes, which is from either from them or traditional recipes that we want to just continue and carry on because we know that food culture is built upon, you know, the legs of tradition, but it's also evolving. And the other part is to show kind of little twists on kind of these dishes and traditions, but then also to create recipes that use Norwegian ingredients in maybe new ways or just familiar ways but only within the Norwegian context. So it's not so much fusion, but it's very much to uplift what's available here. And hopefully that will inspire not only people who live in Norway, but for those of you who live outside can find something similar or, you know, you can look at it and say, ah, I, I like to make this, but I have this at home. So it's to hopefully inspire everyone to cook seasonally, locally and look beyond the plate. Um, so I'll have Josh show me the next picture. Uh, and this is kind of a play on tradition. And uh, so the in the summertime, there's a traditional dish of rumgrut, which is sour cream porridge. And so there was a summer and I was going to make it, but it was so hot that summer. And I decided, no, 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 we, I, I can't, I can't bear eating a bowl of hot, hot sour cream porridge, even though I love it. But I thought, no, no, but what can I do? Can I make something that would still honor the traditional dish, but be more fun and something I could eat on this hot summer day? And so the idea of ice cream was like, oh yes, we have to do that. So this is the Rumiger ice cream. This is uh, sour cream based ice cream. And if you have a bowl of rumigret, what is traditional is to sprinkle sugar and cinnamon on top. And I had this idea because when I first came to Norway, one of the first things I did in Bergen was waiting along the line at Bregen, which is kind of the port around the water. And all the, everyone's lined up to get ice cream in the summer. And even not the summer, actually. Norwegians eat ice cream all the time. But they have this thing where they will sprinkle like a powder, like a chocolate powder thing over it. And I remember that I was sitting there with soft serve ice cream and they're all coming out of this line. And I thought, okay, what is that? And my husband's like, oh yeah, you know, we just, we just dumped this chocolate powder all over it, which is basically like a hot chocolate powder and it's dipped. And then it's like this beautiful um, covering for it. And I thought that's such a fun connection to then take the cinnamon and the sugar and sprinkle it around the top to give it that same feel of, you know, when you're waiting in line to get your, your soft serve, and then you're going to have this beautiful powder. So it's the same kind of feel with it. And also um, what's often served with rumigat at the traditional, the setter, which is the summer farm in Norway is cured meats, usually a cured sheep leg, which is fenolor. So I also took fenolor and cut it up. We diced it and fried it kind of like a bacon almost so it's really crispy and then you can put it on top of the ice cream so you get the full meal the full setter meal as well so that is a recipe and that one is also in the cookbook uh, that's just kind of a play on the twist uh, of tradition and the next recipe I want to share with you this one is also from the cookbook but this is uh, showing using in local ingredients in kind of new ways and these are spruce tips one of my favorite, because I think they're so fun. But in the spring for like two weeks in May, there's this opportunity to go and pick the really young tips as they're just coming up because they're still really soft and they have this citrusy taste. And it actually was used to be eaten in order to prevent scurvy because it's high in vitamin C. And you can also, you can forage for them and then you can freeze them and save them for later. So they're really, really fun. And I was trying to think of a fun thing to do with them because typically you make a syrup in Norway and you'll see the syrup is being poured right there in the picture. And it brings this beautiful color and it's just, an, it's an amazing syrup. But I thought, oh, it'd be kind of fun if maybe we could like fry them in beer batter. And, and it worked really well because you have that fat and then the salt and, and then the acidity from the, the lemony um, spruce tip. So this was another kind of, will it work? Could we try it? And it worked really well. And it's really, really fun. And it's also using beer, local beer from the brewery and using uh, traditional syrup 
And then just kind of a fun twist on spruce tips. Uh, so then we have the next recipe. And this one is, this is a more traditional, this is whipped lingonberry cake, which is kind of similar to a cheesecake in a sense, or at least it has that kind of cheese, uh, cheese taste, uh, cheesecake taste. Uh, but I was in, there was um, a very tiny island called Olnes, and it is next to Olesund or nearby Olesund, which is just up on the northern coast of Norway. And they're famous for their lighthouse. And right next to the lighthouse or connected to it is this cafe. And they, she, there's a lady who's been running it and she serves, you know, cakes and coffee for the afternoon. But she's absolutely famous for this, her lingonberry uh, cheesecake or cake like this. And I tried to get the recipe, but they were, you know, lips were sealed. And, but they gave a few hints, like they told me that they were using lingonberry jam, which is really nice because it's also something you can get internationally as well. And so I tried to piece together what I could off of the tastes and, and put together cake. So this is a, like a, another recipe that we have, and this is on the site, but this is something to kind of pay homage to Allness and to that lovely lady on under the lighthouse who's been making this beautiful cake for so long and that all the visitors stop by and get so this is kind of a yeah a lovely homage to to her and kind of the and then the next recipe I want to share this is Norway's national dish of forkol and forkol is eaten in September the last Thursday of the month is forkol day and that is when everyone will, will have it, or at least they'll have it during the month. And, but this is another little twist on the tradition. Forkle is typically cooked indoors and it's layered cabbage with lamb and then peppercorns. And here I wanted to do something different. So we grilled the cabbage out on the fire and the meat, and then we layered it and we let it cook for a few hours over. And it gives it this really lovely, like, um, I don't want to say like a, not a burnish, but it gives us this nice, just the fire flavor. And if you cook over fire, you'll know what I mean. It's just a wonderful thing that really brings out more of the tastes from the vegetables and the caramelization. And this was really fun because it's, it's a, again, another way of taking a dish that is so traditional and lovely, and you don't have to change the tradition of it, but we can still keep the tradition and do it in a, in a different setting, in a little different way to kind of bring out something more and hopefully encourage other people who maybe don't like necessary foracle always to try it in a different capacity. Uh, so that is a lot of what you, you find with me and my recipes. It's definitely tradition, but it is most certainly about also innovating and little twists at the same time to hopefully inspire others to, to cook and have fun with it as well. So I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what Norwegian cuisine is today. And um, it's a, it's an interesting thing because we, you know, we have the new Nordic scene, which is very much the restaurant and it's a beautiful and aesthetic and it's, it's just complex and it's wonderful. And Norway is, has quite a few Michelin star restaurants now that are constantly in the news, which is wonderful. Um, but it's also this everyday Norwegian cookie. And for those of you who maybe live in Norway or, or have been here quite often, you'll know that like we have Taco Friday, which is Taco Kit Friday. And Norway is the highest consumer of frozen pizzas. So you have this really interesting uh, mixture of, you know, everyday cooking, of, which is a lot of processed foods and still making traditional foods like shutkaka with like the meatballs and, and potatoes and fish and potatoes with also this really high standard of Michelin star. And, and also a lot of trends and, and taking on international cuisines. So, it's why it's even more important, I think, to celebrate the ingredients that are here and to show all the producers that are here as well that are maintaining tradition, but also building upon the tradition. And a lot of them are doing that. And the next photo I think Josh has is, this is a picture of pickled herring. And I met these, this wonderful family. It's a brother and a sister. 
and they, and her husband, and they took over their family's herring business or sild in Norway. It's called Juvik Sild. And it is, I think the grandfather started in 1920s and they're using their father's recipe. And it is one of the best pickled herring that you can get in Norway. It's absolutely delicious. But what's so wonderful about them is that they're incredibly passionate about taking this fish, this ingredient that was so important, which it's known as the silver of the sea because it was so important for the economy. It would save Europe in war. I mean, it's just, it was it's such a tiny fish, but so important. And they're taking this, they're reviving it there. They make it, it's so good. They're different flavors, but they also want to encourage young people and those who maybe grew up thinking that it was kind of poor man's food or like food that you don't really want to eat into something very unique and special. This is just one of the dishes they made for me. They made very many, but I think it's really, it was delicious. It's their kind of spice, it's almost Christmas spice. It's like a ginger and it's served with just fresh Norwegian strawberries, which are the best and chili and honey and red onion. And it just kind of shows you that you have these, these like generation of families coming up that care so much for the tradition and what their family built. And then they're going to build on top of that to ensure that the generations coming ahead will carry it on because they enjoy it, because it will be something they can connect with and they love the flavor of. So absolutely fascinating. And her, their neighbor who actually lives similar on the island is the next image. And this is um, Michael from North Sea Salt Works. And she is actually an American who is married to a Norwegian and they and their two kids and they live out on an island up in the north coastline. And she's extracting salt from the sea right there. And she is just such a force. And she's just so passionate about ensuring that we're using local products. And you would think, you know, sea salts, it's stuff we have the huge coastline. We should be finding lots of Norwegian sea salt, but there's not as many. So she really made it a point to put it on the map. And she, of course, is really, it's so important, especially in the rural parts of Norway, that we keep young people there and create jobs and businesses so that they don't all go to the city and that they start appreciating more about the products that are found here. And so she's very big on ensuring that the young people are employed and helping and taking an active role into the future of the food system which is absolutely wonderful. And the next shot I have for you, this is a picture of, this is a chef uh, who works in uh, Gudbrandsdalen and Gudbrandsdalen has uh, this, they're famous for a dish, it's called kol. And it's basically a soup and it can be cabbage and potatoes and carrots and, and meat or bacon. And it's different variations. But this is just him again. We were outside. It was the most beautiful day. We were just doing a tour. And he just wanted to show how you could take that traditional dish and, you know, using local ingredients. The lamb is from this local farm. The carrots, the cabbage, everything was around the area. And instead of a soup, you know, we could turn into something. He cooked it over the fire. It's a really thick, it's got so much flavor. And again, just showing that you can take something traditional and then have your own twist, but using local ingredients to really bring out all the flavor. So you have a lot of chefs today in Norway who are so passionate about it and that's what they are delivering. And the, the next picture, which are these cheeky goats, which I just absolutely <laughs> adore, uh, if you've been around Norway, you'll notice that there are a lot of goats. There are a lot of animals all over. And the one thing that's so lovely here is in the summer, the animals graze freely. They roam around the mountains and the areas. And, you know, it's just such a lovely thing. They're so happy. It's little happy goats. And goat milk is incredible. It's important for the, for the food culture here because it helps with the, the different types of cheeses. And I also kind of wanted to point out that Norway does make some of the world's best cheese. In fact, there is a blue cheese fauna, fauna blue cheese, and they won the, uh, the world's best cheese a few years ago. And in 2018, I was a judge at the World Cheese Awards that was based in Bergen. And second place went to this um, Norwegian Bruno, so Jaitust, uh, which is brown cheese. 
producer who actually lives not so far from us over the mountain in Telemark. And she won second place for the brown cheese, which is incredible because one brown cheese technically isn't a cheese because it's a byproduct of whey. But again, it's showing that you have these producers all over Norway who are making cheeses and different things with milk or goats, goat's milk, cow's milk. And, you know, they're taking it to this next level that's being recognized on a world stage and it's just getting better and better. So I recommend anytime you're in Norway that you do try to kind of do a loop around to these smaller farms because they're, they're doing some incredible, incredible things. This lady right here, her goats, she's making a type of feta and, you know, there's other producers who are doing chevra, mozzarella, all these international cheeses, which are now being made here as well. So it's, it's so much fun. And Norway is known for its dairy. And it's some of the best in the world. So I suggest that you come to Norway, definitely make room for eating a lot of cheese and dairy. And um, next, I just also wanted to touch a little bit on these beautiful apples. Uh, Norway has fantastic orchards and Hardanger is the area of Norway that is known for it. In fact, they are trying to be the next champagne. So they want to be, they make cider, apple cider, the alcohol kind, and they want to be the champagne of apple cider. So they are working to get that um, notoriety and the actual classification on a world stage as well. And also going off of the cider is you have some of the best gin makers in the world here. They have mead makers and we have artisanal beer and all these new things that are coming up and they're popping up from all different parts of Norway. And it's just absolutely incredible because it shows, what I want to kind of show you with this is that there's such variety in the Norwegian food culture. Yes, it is the typical, you know, meat and potatoes or fish and potatoes. Uh, definitely, that's so part of it. And yes, it has these taco Fridays and, you know, frozen pizzas and it has you know taco trucks and things uh in the cities and it has these wonderful beautiful restaurants that are getting their mission stars and it's also about local ingredients seasonal ingredients and local producers and artisans that are doing their best to really show the food culture and what is available here on a world stage and so it's such a beautiful glorious mix of all these types of things. And that's together make this beautiful Norwegian food culture and cuisine that I absolutely adore sharing with you all. And so that kind of leads me up to, uh, just to let you know with, with me and what's gonna be happening this year with North Wild Kitchen. Um, I'm focusing this year, my theme is Valvara, which means it's the Norwegian word for the state of well-being. And I think this is so important because with the food culture and Norway and Norwegians, Norwegians are so connected to nature. It's like you can't have one without the other. And therefore, I just love the, being able to apply that lifestyle as well to the food and because they just go hand in hand. And within the umbrella of Velvara or the state of well-being are the concepts uh, free lift sleeve, which you may all have heard of, which is quite a buzzword now. And that's just about getting outdoors, outdoor recreation. And, you know, Norwegians are famous for their, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. And so it's kind of all about how can we just get outdoors, get fresh air, and that's going to help our mental, our health, our physical, everything, spiritual, that whole part of us will be even better. So I'm looking under that, the free lift sleeve. So a lot of cooking outdoors, you'll probably see a lot this year, as I usually do, especially when the weather gets better. We're covered in snow, but that still doesn't deter us from going out and having coffee over the, the fire or whatnot. Uh, and then of course, there's Dugnod that I'll be talking about, which is about volunteering and supporting your community. And then I'll also be discussing or looking under the umbrella of, of course, Kusili or Higa, which is the whole idea of the coziness and the atmosphere and all the things that we do that really help 
enhance that moment, whether it's candles or fire or warm mittens or the people you're with or whatever's on your plate, you know, all of it kind of comes together to really create this wonderful picture of, of comfort and home. And so you'll be seeing a lot of that this year. Also, I am going to be carrying on my partnership with Tina Brunost and Tina is Norway's largest dairy cooperative. And if you've ever been here in Norway, or if you do live here, you'll see that Tina is the brand that's kind of all over. It's the milk and the cheese and, and whatnot. And they're absolutely wonderful, but I have so much fun with them because it's about taking this very iconic Norwegian cheese and coming up with ways then people might not normally think to use it. It's typically put on like waffles or on a piece of bread or in a stew, but this is just kind of a fun play. And there's a picture I think Josh of next, which is, these are the Bruno's caramel cinnamon buns. You'll find all this on the website, but this was just kind of a fun play. Again, it's just using a very stereotypical Norwegian ingredient in fun ways and an ingredient that is found internationally as well. So for those of you outside of Norway, it's available as Ski Queen or Jaitust, and you can also make it at home. So it's just to bring Norway into, into your home and to inspire Norwegians here as well. And another thing, I just wanted to show the Brunos burger that I had made earlier in the year. And um, it's just a fun way. It's just a fun thing to show and how, you know, Norwegians, uh, sometimes it takes them a little bit while to warm up to new things. And I remember talking about, you know, ooh, putting Brunos on a burger and getting these horrified looks of like, that would be awful and you can't do that. And, and yet it turned out to be uh, actually quite beloved. And there's a funny story is I was uh, asked to do kind of an interview for American food for the election night. And this was with VG, which is Norway's, one of their biggest newspapers. And so it was online and they were on the paper, but then it was online. And because the election lasted, they were counting for so many days after I was on like the front page for a week with the Brunos marshmallows and the Brunos um, burger. And I got so many emails and messages from Norwegians who were saying, Oh, it's the best ever. I never would have thought it's so good. And even a restaurant in Oslo, they are, they make burgers and they had their own variation of this burger on their, uh, their monthly featured burger menu. So it was quite funny and, and always so fun to be able to, to kind of just take something and turn it in a little new way to inspire people and then to have them go and try and make something else and something new and get really excited about local ingredients. So you'll be seeing a lot more Brunos this year as well. And I hope that will inspire you if you do enjoy it. Uh, and also I'm partnering with Kvare Arctic and they are a uh, third generation family of salmon farmers in the island of Kvare, which is actually just between, it's up on the Northern coast. It sits at the Arctic sea. It's a tiny island, there's 80 inhabitants and, but they are so passionate about the welfare of uh, the salmon and also taking care of the environment. They're the top leaders in aquaculture and they're just providing for a sustainable future and to be able to feed people and to provide a product that's immense quality. And they are based, their products sell in the US. So I'm very happy to be working with them. So you also get a lot of inspirational recipes based on salmon. So be a good thing. And, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of the free lips leave as well, which is going to be cooking outdoors with them. And also I wanted to share with you guys, if you want to pull up the next picture, Josh. So you are the first group of people that I'm actually telling this to. But I have, and very exciting, is that I'm going to be uh, moving over my office space to this beautiful building right here. This is the Vegli uh, train station. It uh, was running from the 1920s until 1989 when it stopped. But now it's available. I'm going to be moving in. And uh, I'll let you know throughout the year what's going to be happening. But the idea is obviously classes and a community garden and a shop 
which will be working on new products as well. North Wild Kitchen collaborating with Norwegian producers. So that will all be new stuff I'll get to share with you all as well. Well, that was just so wonderful, Nevada. And we're getting all kinds of gushing comments in the chat and people also sharing their own um, stories of heritage from Norway and how they're so sad they can't travel right now, but they're looking forward to in the future. Um, and we have a lot of questions. And so we will just do our very best to try to include as many as we can. And I think I'll start and then Josh and I will kind of jockey back and forth. Uh, but uh, we're going to start with a question from Eleanor, and she's wondering what your favorite Norwegian dish is. Ah, I knew someone was going to ask this. Um, it's really hard to say if I have an absolute favorite, but because I look forward to so many things as the seasons come by. So for once, when the spring comes, I'm going to be out there picking those spruce tips like no one else and you know the chanterelles and the wild strawberries uh, I really look forward to like the four call in September pinnishet is the traditional Christmas dish we eat for Christmas which is the cured lamb ribs and so those are kind of things I have once a year and I don't really have them again but like for the summer the rumigret I uh, the rumigret is I really enjoy a good rumigret that's properly made with this the really full fat sour cream and bokalau actually it's one of my favorite dishes which is very it's a spanish it's an it's a dish that's influenced from the spanish and the portuguese so it's got a lot of uh, pepper and garlic and uh tomato and it's the the tomato layered with the um dried and salted cod in this beautiful stew but it's yeah i don't know there's a lot of them but seasonal yeah in nevada while you're talking about seasonal foods, maybe you could talk about some of the things that you really like to forage in Norway, maybe some some top uh, ingredients. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, that's what's so fun about Norway is it's like, you know, there's so many things and we live in the mountains. So our foraging is, you know, it's a lot more, it's not like the seaweed or the coastal areas, but we have the chant like chanterelles, the spruce tips. Uh, we have wild, the little wild strawberries, um, bilberries because they're wild blueberries and uh oh cloudberries i absolutely adore cloudberries multibar and those only come at the like end of july so sometimes you get it a lot sometimes not any at all and it depends on the season what we can find but just for like small things that you can get also other places dandelions superfood incredible everywhere so you can just grab those uh sorrel which has that sharp tangy uh flavor like wood sorrel and ooh, ooh, oh, geitrums. Uh, wait, is that the English? No, that's the Norwegian, isn't it? Fireweed, fireweed is the English. Um, rose bay, I think it's rose bay willow as well. Uh, I love those, those are the best. I mean, because you can eat everything, you can eat the stock, and then you have the, the beautiful leaves, uh, the petals, and they make the most glorious uh drinks in color. So, yeah, I don't know. I was so excited because there's so many things that I haven't learned. Like I only know this much compared to what I could know. So I'm, I'm excited every year to try and find new things. Great. So um, Andrea is wondering about in the video, there was krumkaka being made over the fire. And she wondered if you could say a little bit more about how that works. She thought it really looked like fun. Oh, oh yeah. I recommend it. Um, I, so we, we were filming we were doing juniper and in the cookbook, I have the recipe for the juniper infused cream. And that's what we are. I put on those that are outside. So I have the little, uh, the crumb cooker iron that you can just, you can put it out on the fire as well. Um, obviously if you have an electric one, you can't, but these are the old fashioned ones and you just, you know, take a little bit so you can't have too much. Otherwise it will go everywhere and just have to do like be very in intuitive with how you're cooking it and turn it and mine I'll, I'll be honest it gets a little burnt and burnished but I have to tell you that it was the best crumb cover I've ever had because there is something about fire and cooking over fire and the taste that just I don't know it transforms it but it really was the best and I I had the two guys with me as well and they were trying it and they they also really enjoyed it so if you can do it have waffles out there too if you can find those old ones or by the campfire start cooking outdoors it's the simplest way and so much more fun yeah 
There's a question here uh, and a comment from your sister. It says uh, she misses you very much and is so Aww. proud of you. My question uh, is, her question, what is one word you would use to characterize your journey growing up near the mountains of Utah to eventually end up on your farm in Norway? Wow, would you say one word? One no. word. Oh my goodness. Sister. Oh. Those sisters, they you get know, you. They do that. They put you in the corner. She's older than me. She's three years older. So it makes sense that she would she would do this. <laughs> so <laughs> gosh, one word. Um Ooh, oh man, that is so hard. I, I kind of feel like wanting to say something like connect connectedness or, or something because I feel that, you know, that's one thing I found. Like we have we have traveled a lot. We've lived in many different places. And there's something about this familiarity that where I go, there's always something that reminds me of something else. And I think Utah, I mean, it's it's gorgeous. I mean, Utah has incredible wild nature. And the mountains, there's something about it where you become really rooted. And so I do feel when I'm here, I have that parallel and that familiarity, that connectedness because of growing up in a place where, you know, you can breathe in and you have that pine smell and you have the mountains and the rock and just feeling it. And then you can come here so far, far away. And yet you still have that same scent and those same things that draw you back. And you just, it, that's why I always say it makes me feel very rooted in the mountains. And it does because it really, it brings me back to my family where I grew up. I can go anywhere, but I know they're still there and I'm still there. You know, it's part of me. So thanks, sister. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are there any recipes that you tried to put a twist on that didn't work? Yeah, well, I, so there's, I have a recipe and it's also in the book, which is the malt, uh, cloudberry, sorry, I always go with the Norwegian to the English. It's the cloudberry caramels. And it was originally supposed, okay, so a cloudberry or multibar is, uh, if you've ever seen one, it has a very thin stalk. And then it kind of has this little cloud ball, this little orange thing on top. And I was, we were foraging for them with some, with our kids. And I thought, oh, it would be so fun to make a sucker because it reminded me of the whole, like, you know, they can hold it and then they can have it. Cause often they're frozen and then saved to make multicram, which is this cloudberry whipped cream for Christmas. And I thought, oh, you know, let's make stuff now. And I went through two pots. <laughs> that were thrown out and burned because it just did not work. Like it just, you could, for whatever it is, I don't know the science behind the, the cloudberries, but it just did not work. They burned. But before it got to the burning point, the caramel part was really, really good. And it had that intense flavor. So even though it didn't work, we still got a really great uh, caramel out of it because of that trial and error. So always trial things because you never know what you'll come up with. But yeah, the, I, I, there are many times I've come up with something and no, uh, it's just, no, it hasn't, hasn't always turned out so well, but that's why we have chickens. We can give them the leftovers. Thank you. They're good for that, for sure. Yeah. There's a lovely question and comment here from uh, Ryder in California. Uh, it says, I live in California, but have two Norwegian children, and I'm constantly striving to connect them with their heritage and their father's culture. We've been cooking many of the recipes from your book, but there are so many ingredients that I do not have access to, primarily herbs. Do you have any tips in that regard? Yeah, I think uh, in the, the front of the cookbook, I try to give some suggestions for what you can use or, or swap around with. Um, I'm just trying to think of what would be some things that would be really difficult. I know some people have had trouble with juniper berries. Uh, I've had some people say that just because maybe not at the grocery store, but those things you can definitely find online or at like World Market or those types of places. Um I always say, I mean, I will try. I mean, obviously you can always ask me directly and I'll give you the best substitute that I can think of. But sometimes like if it is cloudberry caramels and you're like, well, there's nowhere I'm going to get cloudberries. Then I, you know, try it with raspberries or strawberries or try something that's your favorite that means something to you and then incorporate that as well. And, um, you know, Norway has different types of flowers. They're a lot more hardy and coarse. But I do think there are now uh, artisanal 
you know, producers in the States on, usually it's usually online where you can find these sorts of things. But I always think if there's something that, you know, if you want, like, I don't, I'm trying to think of anything. It could just be something simple as like waffles or, or like the Brunos, which you can find as well over there. Um, little things that can connect you back to it. But I, there is quite a lot that I would say you can find, but it is, it is some of those kind of more foraging and, and wild herbs. But that's also something I say, just swap with what you have near you and get inspired. If you see a recipe, don't feel you have to make it exactly as it is, you know, have fun with it, try new things. And of course, use what's around you and, and local farmers and support your local area as much as possible as well. Thank you. Yeah, we were talking actually during a rehearsal the other day about sourcing ingredients and, um, you know, some of the producers that you use even are available here in the States through Whole Foods. And Josh and I were even commenting that in our little town of Decora, our local food co-op, you know, has ski queen cheese, uh, you know, yaito. So, so I think you just have to kind of uh, there's more availability and there's different ways. I noticed some people are putting in the chat, even some um, online sourcing. So perhaps it's through the community you build on food culture that you learn more and more about this. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for one more question. And so um, Cassandra is saying, thank you, sweet Nevada. Um, what is your favorite story memory from meeting with local people who shared their recipes with you? <gasps> Oh my goodness. I don't know if there's just one because they're, oh, I, I've had so many. Um, I feel so grateful and blessed. Uh, the fact that, you know, I've had the women here who've taken me in and they taught me like the recipe that their great, great, great grandmother taught them and they're showing me and they're just, you know, no hold bars and they're so happy about it is, is such an amazing thing. And, oh, I don't know. I've, oh my goodness. I've had so many incredible food experiences. Um, oh, I don't, I'm trying to think of one. I mean, I can't pick one that's over, over the other, but I do have to say one of my first stories, um, obviously I've done the bakeries here and the women have been so kind, like Mola's Bakery and Uvdal's Live and Bakery. But we have our Vegli Bakery that is run by um, a man named Niels. And I think he, they make the bread uh, in town. And I, he was one of the first stories and I was so touching because he's such a humble man and he just came in and he showed me and my Norwegian, I was like the, I've been there here for like four months. And, and so we were just trying to like, you know, get by with, uh, he was doing Norwegian and I'm in English and he was just walking me around the bakery and he's just showing me the different breads and kind of the new things. And he was just, incredible and I think that's what's so wonderful is you have these people who are so kind so humble they have and you know he's he's been in this town he never left I don't think he ever took a vacation and he was always so dedicated and I just it was such a joy to write about him and to to tell my experience about who he was as a as a kind human being and the things he's done for this community that maybe don't always get recognized and, and I wrote, his daughter wrote to me after and was just really, and just so kind that, that, you know, someone would talk so highly about our father. And I just thought, oh, there's so many of these people just like him around here who are so wonderful and the, the carriers of the food culture. And they're just, you know, they don't, they don't shout about, it's not very Norwegian to like say, look at me, look at me. Um, and they just, you know, they just carry on and they, they do what they have to do. Uh, but it's people like that, that just, yeah, that just, that makes this, what I do. That's the best part of the job. If you, if you can call it a job, uh, is these people and, and they're so inspirational to me. So, yeah. Thank you. 